So in part one of our rhetoric of science section, I presented to you the idea that science is objective and therefore rhetoric has no place in it. And in part two, I offered you a competing perspective, which is that science is a discipline and therefore is an ongoing rhetorical act. So either there is no rhetoric in science, and if it is, it's an aberration, or the other side, which is that science is uh, a function of rhetoric. And I've asked you to choose between the two. Uh, hopefully you have commented uh, in one of the two videos. Uh, maybe there could be some interesting conversation going on uh, on the comment boards. In part three of this rhetoric of science section, I would like to propose a sort of a halfway uh, perspective. For those of you who said, oh, maybe it's the one or uh, maybe it's the other, um, I would uh, not be a cognitively complex thinker if I did not offer you a third option. So, in part three, science as a speculative pursuit. Now, <clears throat> the purpose of science is to get to objective truths, right? That's the goal. And I think that almost any scientist is going to agree with that. But it's not actually the objective world that science concerns itself with. The, the objective world is the subject of the study, right? That's the thing that they're looking at. But what science did differently a couple of hundred years ago was it that it didn't offer a, a different way of looking at the world. It offered a different way of talking about the way that we looked at the world. And this is what I mean. If you can remember the scientific process back when you were in high school, right? One, introduce the topic. Two, formulate hypothesis. Three, create a research project. Four, uh, create, collect data. Five, analyze that data. Six, decide whether or not your hypothesis was correct. Now, that in and of itself is actually the beauty of science. It's not that science could find out what was ultimately going on. In fact, there have been many people trying to find objective truths all the way through human history. I mean, think about it. Do you think, I mean, Plato said that this notebook has an objective notebookness out there in the world, and it's always true, and the ideal of notebook, right, I mean, objective truth has existed before science. Um, and, uh, you know, take any, uh, you know, fanatical, fanatic believer, right? This is what God said, and this is true, uh, always true, objectively true, in the world, and maybe not in the physical world, but certainly in the spiritual world, an objective truth. So it's not actually that science is the first person who has concerned itself with certain truths, but science is the first uh, pursuit that did so uncertain. Right? The goal of science is to create certain truths, but the process of science is actually to use uncertainty, is to use speculative processes. And so, our third perspective is that science is a speculative endeavor. Um, explanations, scientific explanations, are always tentative. They're always, this is the set of data that I collected, and this is my explanation to the best of my ability. But if you collect better data, or you create a better way of explaining my and your data, I'll defer to you instead. Now, that is said, and that is spoken, and that is part of scientific discourse, and the ability to bring both of our ideas to the table, and for us to negotiate them, and to, 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 to bring them together, is a rhetorical process. However, it's not rhetorical in the classic sense because it's not persuasive. In fact, science almost prides itself in being anti-persuasive or using the, re the, the scientific rhetoric as presenting the idea so that it is very easily disagreed with, right? If I come to a conclusion based off of a lot of details, I can just throw stories at you and, as, as to persuade you, but science isn't like that. Science lays out each and every single step so that if I made a mistake anywhere along the way, someone else can come along and edit it so that a better conclusion has come by. Science almost invites other people to take issue with the science that had been done. Now, um, 
this diminishes the authority of the particular person, but the idea is that it raises the, the, the credibility of the project overall because it doesn't rely on individual authorities, it actually relies on the validity of the process. Um, so rhetoric, um, in this understanding of science, science as a uh, speculative endeavor, rhetoric is um, certainly not the point. It's not supposed to be persuasive. But rhetoric serves a critical role in maintaining the scientific integrity of any of the research being done. Because it is rhetoric that invites the criticism, that perfects the science, that makes it better and better and better. Which is really cool. So, the reason I say that this is sort of the third and in-betweener is because it, science as a speculative discipline, understanding science as speculative, means that you accept that science is symbolic and science is discursive, right? That it involves dialogue. But it's to reject a strong use of persuasion. And as we have understood all through, you know, all, all throughout, uh, you know, this study of rhetoric, rhetoric has kind of multiple explanations. And part of it has to do with you know, energy transmitted through symbols, and part of it has to also to do with getting people to do what you want or think the way that you want them to. Um, and good science, from this perspective, eschews the, uh, um, espouses the one and eschews the other. Um, it, it, it espouses, it brings in the idea um, that this is a dialogue, but it eschews, it, it kicks out the idea that this needs to be persuasive. Um, I think this is particularly neat because scientists, you know, are often offended by the notion of the, the rhetoric of science, right? Because they don't think what they do is a conversation, right? Um, they've had conversations before and what they're doing isn't one of them, right? Um, now, just because you upset science, scientists doesn't mean you're doing bad philosophy, uh, but um, it, it is worth saying that that Many people, uh, and if you read the, the sort of last section of uh, uh, the chapter that talks about science and rhetoric, um, there is a, a pretty compelling uh, rip on um, the rhetoric of science, and I, I suggest that you read it. Um, but one of the reasons I really like this um, is that it, it allows, uh, I, I think, a fairer understanding of the role that rhetoric does play. Um, because I think the scientist or the philosopher of language who says that rhetoric has no business in science is foolish, right? To the, that it is a human pursuit, that it is symbol using, but I think that it also is sort of a softer uh, read because it also, it's, it, instead of saying, no, it is rhetoric, right? Which the scientists are saying that it's not. And instead of accepting the science as objective and saying that rhetoric has no business, I think that this is a clearer um, and gentler and honestly more accurate, in my opinion. Uh, this is the one I like the best, in case you couldn't tell. In my opinion, it's more honest, um, because science couldn't exist if it wasn't for the invitational rhetoric, right? If it wasn't for that dialogue that said, you know what, I'm going to say this, but don't take my word for it, do the science yourself. Um, now, uh, it's worth noting that there is actually a, a, a movement inside rhetoric called invitational rhetoric. Um, and basically this understands uh, classic Western rhetoric as like controversial rhetoric, which is to say that I, I come out there and I say the one thing that I want to say and everybody else is wrong. Whereas invitational rhetoric is a, is a kind of rhetorical process, it's a kind of public speaking, but it also creates a certain kind of uh, discourse where it actually asks people to bring their voices into the conversation. Um, right, invitational. It invites other rhetorics in order to, uh, to, to function. And you'll find this um, <coughs> in some, uh, you'll find this in some people's speakings. This is a central ten tenet to, to feminism. you also find this in some organizations um, who use collaborative decision making uh, as a way of you know, creating policy and making decisions. And that rhetoric can be made more gentle if you say, no, not only can this be used as a way of making my truth real in the world, it can be used as a way of making this world real and actually protecting all of the voices in this conversation as opposed to trying to drown them out and dominate them. And it is that protection of all the voices that actually allows science to get better and better because it allows more and more people to participate in the process. That's the third.
science as a speculative endeavor.